Welcome back, listener, to the Lost in Postulation podcast. I'm Nicola Volpi. Happy New Year. And I'm joined by everybody's favorite veterinarian. It's Neil Fitzpatrick. Oh, a sh- sh- cheap shot at Noel Fitzpatrick there for the list, <laughs> for the uninitiated listener. Uh, my, my biggest social media rival slash uh, celebrity rival, Noel Fitzpatrick, who uh, we have a one-sided beef with. I'm beefing with him. He does not know that I'm beefing with him, but... Um, Kind of like Stephen King with uh, James Patterson. Exactly. Call him out. Classic. The best of beefs are the one-sided ones. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. No cringe at all there, right? No, no, never. Never, yeah. never. Yeah. Fantastic. How, how's your New Year been so far, man? Very good. Would have loved an extra week off, to be honest. It mm. was a lot of traveling and seeing uh, family in, on different sides of Europe and then uh, back in Copenhagen now, had a day to myself and then it was back to work. So busy, but uh, brilliant, of course. Like amazing to, uh, to see everybody, but uh, yeah. Times. Yeah. Very good. How about, Very you? Good. How about you? Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. I've uh, Santa Claus brought me a new microphone, so hey. we hope that's uh, that's shining I'd through. I'd say right? the listeners have noticed already. They're like, "Hey, what's this jumping audio quality?" Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No more hard peas, you know, and no more yeah. sticking my nose into the. Into hopefully, the mic hopefully, no more gale force winds during, uh, <laughs> during <laughs> exactly, recording. Yeah. Exactly. We shall see. No, but feel like a new person with that, and we're recording in a new studio today. Yeah, as here well, we are. So, uh, Big thanks to the studio for getting us uh, from, a lovely space here. Yeah. From an undisclosed location. Hey, an anonymous donor, a well wisher exactly. who wishes as well. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and everything else, all good. I actually got some time uh, out on the slope skiing a bit with the with the little snow that is uh, left around the oh, world. Bad. And uh, and I thought a lot about you while I was doing it. <laughs> oh no! Uh, uh, I just uh, I remembered that uh, actually uh, one of the first activities we did together uh, about six seven years ago was mm. go on a ski trip uh, with sure. friends. And, uh, sure you know, I thought uh, in an effort to uh, engage with our audience maybe a little bit, you'd uh, you'd like to enlighten them a bit oh. on how that trip went. Any any memories Jeez. you might have? Okay, well, you know, testament to the, the phrase, you know, nobody's perfect. Uh, I do have a severe weakness uh, in the realm of skiing and ski-related activities. All snow sports, potentially. I haven't even tried snowboarding. I was a late bloomer. Uh, I was not uh, a privileged youth who had the chance to go skiing in my... Uh, in late my bloomer presumes you were a bloomer. Well, yeah, a late, uh, <laughs> late, <laughs> late failure, maybe. Uh, I never had the chance to fail until my mid twenties. But um, let it be. Let, let, let's just say that um, I've had mixed success with skiing. My level of enjoyment is like ten out of ten. I think it's amazing, mm-hmm. and I actually can't wait to go back again. Working on plans for twenty twenty four early uh, ski season, Fantastic. perhaps. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there there have been in- incidents, and one in particular, nothing serious, so let's get that out of the way. It didn't break any bones. <laughs> Actually, the injury was more severe. It was to my ego and to my pride. Mental Basically, one. long story short, for, for the dear listener here, um, we I was having a great day, skiing around with some, with some friends from work and uh, just... Loving it, and the confidence is through the roof. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finding myself hitting some sick lines, feeling like an absolute pro. Absolutely. My knees are, and my knees have never been closer together. It's just uh, an absolute dream. <laughs> and I'm on the ski lift, and lo and behold, uh, in front of me, there's a sign saying, "Get off here unless you want to go up to the next slope." The next slope is for advanced skiers only. And I was like, in in a, a heady days of of confidence, I was like, "Well, how hard can it be? I mean, it's only a black slope, and people do those all the time." My friends sitting next to me are going to do it, so how hard can it be? Anyway, it was really hard, as it turned out. So uh, I went down an unfairly mogul-filled slope yeah. where it became clear that I could either fall my way down this hill or walk down this hill. But there was no third option. There was no skiing option no for, this, no. for this particular hill. So uh, I was blessed with um, the kind friends who uh, came to get me. Not you, not among them, though. I should I should point out. I think oh, uh, I, I was one of the two two of them. But there were uh, deferring schools of thought on yeah. how we should approach. It. Yeah, uh, you were very much of the uh, learn uh, by painful failure approach. So <laughs> make uh, him ski down. He has to learn, <laughs> uh, which I didn't appreciate. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it had nothing to learn from this experience. Really, it was a case of now. Do I break any bones here or do I walk for 20 minutes? And I took the walk for 20 minutes option. Um, but I'll tell you what's not fun is when you're walking down a slope that everyone else just skied down and they're just watching and laughing at you. Because uh, yeah, also it takes significantly longer to oh, walk down like than ski down, right? Exponentially so, longer, yeah. yeah. And nobody appreciates being made to wait, let alone but due to a silly mistake that I made. Uh, so thanks for thinking of me. Thanks for Absolutely. mentioning this uh, very proud moment in my skiing it's career. A pleasure. But um, I'm hoping for next time to have a slightly more successful ski trip. Well, and we'll provide a soft landing because I remember you weren't too discouraged by that. So you were Mm. a bit down the rest of the day. But two days later, uh, the rest of our group, you know, they had a big night. And you and I were the only ones up on our skis at 8.30, 9 in the morning, first lift. 
Jeez. And you are actually, you know, quite keen to learn and, yeah. and listening. And at one point I said, you know what, Neil, you're moving your upper body way yeah. too much. It makes no sense. Give me your poles Best and ski ever. without it. I just and remember you look great. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is my thing. Like nothing motivates me more than embarrassment, you know. So determined never to have that happen again, I was like, I need to actively get way better at this and like can't take, uh, can't take another day of that mortification. So, yeah, actually, that's a good tip for any newbie skiers, right? Those poles. They're your best friend, and in some ways, they're your worst enemy. Um, they're getting in the way. You need to focus on your feet, right? False sense of security. Exactly. And the minute you start relying on them for anything other than a little push here and there, it's like, forget about it. Yeah, as, absolutely. As a pro skier, I can I can mention that. Yeah. So for the annual Lost in Postulation uh, ski run, which will start next year, uh, all types of skiers are welcome. Just bring the right attitude like our favorite veterinarian does. And leave your poles at home. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no so, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing that with all our listeners, uh, with our community. Um, we have a banger of an episode lined up for today. Absolutely insane. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous episode. And time has, has really done us favors here. We've prepared some serious content for you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, right before we get into that, though, maybe just a bit of, uh, of admin, you know, mm-hmm. let's, mm-hmm. Uh, let's get that stuff out of the way. So first thing, a massive thanks to, to the community, which now actually is a community. I mean, it's, it's growing. Uh, we've had a couple of our, of our best weeks uh, of podcast downloads the last we've couple. We've turned a corner, yeah. yeah. And we're in the low triple digits now in terms of like, you know, downloads and what have you. But um, that's kind of uh, unusual, I think, for, for an early days uh, setup uh, situation like us. So like... Yeah, off to a really encouraging start, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thanks to everyone that's been, uh, been sending in uh, uh, feedback, been, been rating, been reviewing. Please keep providing that. It really helps to grow the podcast, mm. helps us to develop our content. And we've actually now made that a bit easier for you. So we've created a Twitter account where you can tweet at us at in postulation so lost in postulation uh didn't meet the character requirements so at in postulation we'll add that in the show notes and also uh can go old school and email at us at lost in postulation at gmail.com that is postulation not population indeed very important if you send it to the other one we don't know what's going to happen to it but uh, this is a brand a brave new day for us because never before have we been able to get listener input into the show from one episode to the next so this will be uh, I think an interesting time to uh, interact even more with the listeners any questions any topic ideas anything you'd like to see in future episodes now with that Twitter account with that email uh, is a lot easier for for us for us to get a read on and uh, and incorporate so uh, please do that and uh well, coming up next, au revoir, Shoshana! We'll be back after the break. All right, welcome back, listener, to, uh, to Lost in Postulation. Now, for this next uh, postulation uh, and discussion, um, we're going to talk about Christoph Waltz, exactly. Mr. To, Waltz. To give him his proper pronunciation. Exactly. Or Herr Waltz, as we would say in the German language, uh, which oh, wow. him being from Austria <laughs> yeah. is fluent in, of course. Um, why are we discussing Christoph Waltz? Well, hmm. well, actually, yeah. good, good question. Yeah. Give me your uh, take and then I'll... Uh... Well, for me, we were discussing, uh, you know, uh, potential uh, overrated, underrated actors, actresses a, a little while back and... Uh, and you seem to feel very strongly uh, about Christoph Waltz, and mm. not necessarily in a positive sense. And when we were lining up ideas for for episodes for the for the new year, I thought, hey, what about uh, what is that postulation around uh, around Christoph Waltz? Uh, and uh, and let's see where that goes. So I don't actually know where you're going to go with this. I know it's yeah. not a, a great spin on uh, on our favorite uh, Austrian uh, or <laughs> some of our favorite one Austrian, of our favorites. the Academy's favorite Austrian. That's for sure. Um, after to Arnold. Absolutely. There's something coming on that, isn't <laughs> yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, before we get into your postulation, though, maybe a bit of background on, on Herr Waltz yeah, yeah. For, for our listeners. Mm. Sound good? Let's do it. So, Christoph Waltz, he's born in Vienna in 1954. So, we're not talking, it's not a spring chicken here, Mm-mm. so we'll get into that. Very much a, a late bloomer like, like yourself on skis. Absolutely. Uh, actually. A great as, example. As great example. Um, he, he's born into a theater family. So, his mother is a, is a costume designer, his, par- his father is a set designer, three out of four grandparents have, have been involved in the theater, so he's very much coming into, 
into show business in a way with not many illusions. That's kind of the, the family business in a way. Uh, fun fact, one of the, his, uh, his maternal grandfather, however, uh, was, uh, was a psychiatrist studying under Sigmund Freud, Ooh, another really? uh, great Austrian. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's very renowned for a sex therapy book. Uh, he wrote, called Sex Perfection and Marital Happiness. Now, I have not read it myself yet, but one, once you're done with it, you can maybe... Uh, yeah, I'll pass it pass on. It I'm along. taking yeah. my time. I'm taking yeah, it slow. I'm reading every page. Highlighting and, and, and yeah, yeah, underlining yeah. the works. That's a big one. So it's it's very much, it's a family of, uh, you know, <laughs> within this intellectual sphere, within this artsy sphere uh, that he comes up in in, uh, in, in Vienna. And uh, once he gets into his career after his studies, he starts working in theater. And slowly but surely, he starts to have some bit parts uh, in German TV, in German-speaking TV. Nothing crazy. I mean, we're talking about, like, you know, showing up in in their version of CSI from time Mm. to time, Mm. right? So really, like, actually having to show up to to put bread on the table, that type of... Uh, of actor, not even C-list, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Fast forward a bunch, uh, and all of a sudden, Quentin Tarantino is acquainted with Herr Waltz, with Mm -hmm. Christoph Waltz, Mm -hmm. uh, puts him in as Colonel Hans Landa of the SS in Inglorious Bastards. Uh, The rest is history. He wins an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor uh, in that at the age of 53 in 2009. Just, Just goes to show. Talk about L.A. Bloomer, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's... Uh, and out of nowhere, American audiences, British audiences, anything outside of the German-speaking sphere didn't really know Christoph Waltz. I think mm-hmm. you might have had to be a bit of a theater, very nerd, underground uh, mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. time. Um, he beats out, actually, for that Oscar, uh, not to give the Academy too much credit, but mm-hmm. Matt Damon in Invictus. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll allow Stanley Tucci in The Lovely Bones. You remember The Lovely Bones? I don't even remember Stanley Tucci, to be honest. But uh, You don't remember Stanley Tucci? No, oh, well. Uh, bit of a blind spot for me. Yeah. Yeah. Stanley Tucci, very, uh, very underrated. He just wrote a cookbook, actually. There you go. Well, that actually, <laughs> probably. Well, he beat out Matt Damon and Stanley Tucci. A couple of years later, Django Unchained, again working for Quentin Tarantino, he goes 2-0 and and wins another Best Supporting Actor Oscar. In this one, you'll like this. He mm. beats out Alan Arkin from Argo. Okay. Hollywood no, Legend. No problem, yeah. Bob De Niro, Silver Linings Playbook. Also, fine, yeah. PSH, Philip Seymour Hoffman, the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, the master. Mm. Yeah. And the legend Tommy Lee Jones and Lincoln. There was some comp- movies used yeah. to be quite good, huh? Yeah, that was that was around that golden <laughs> age. Like, yeah, yeah, those few years there, like, wow, yeah, yeah. insane. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and uh, and the rest is history. So, one of the maybe the only actor that was two and zero straight off the bat uh, at the Oscar, uh, and uh, very much somebody that uh, that helped uh, usher in that uh, that Tarantino Renaissance. Uh, we'll get into that a bit later. So. Now we've been acquainted with uh, with our character, Herr Christoph Waltz. And uh, Neil, the floor is yours to hit us with the postulation. Yes. Okay, here we go. In, in our podcast to date, I know I've had a few postulations, a few assertions which have garnered a little bit of unrest among the listeners. There's been a few, I've gotten a few direct messages from people who've said, I fully disagree with you on this and that. Mm. And I've taken that on the chin all the way through. I've always said, well, you know, I'm, I stand by it. And here comes another one. And this one, I know, is going to ruffle so many feathers, like a a, a ridiculous amount. But please, all I can ask the listener is please bear with me to explain myself. Because what I'm about to say is going to hurt. It's going to be painful to hear. You're not going to like it. (laughs) Wow. But if you just bear with me, I actually think by the end, there's a few people who will have maybe changed their thinking a little bit. That's all I'm here to do. I just want to provoke. I just want to... Start the start the conversation about this. Is this where we give a content warning for the Austrian listeners to oh, just join 100%. us on the next episode? If you are a deeply patriotic Austrian, and I've looked at the stats, we do have a couple in Austria. <laughs> so uh, if you're that person, couple million. I, I apologize because I, I, my intent is not to hurt anyone's feelings here, least of all Christoph's. Christoph, if you're listening, I think you're great as a guy. Um, and as a guy. <laughs> as a guy. and um, the point here mainly is, let, let's call this, we're, we're just starting the conversation. My point is, At the end of the day, Christoph Waltz is not a good actor. 
Okay. Loaded. Now, he's Controversial. Not, and I mean every word of that, and I mean specifically that wording. And in order for this to be correct, right, in order for me to prove myself correct here, I need to correctly define what, what is a good actor, right? And that's what I want to get to. First of all, a few caveats. His performance in Inglorious Bastards is an excellent performance by an actor. So I'm not here to say that he did a bad job in Inglorious Bastards. However, I would stand by that an actor can have a good performance in a movie and be a not very good actor. And that's the case in, in, this, uh, in this example. Mm. So this is what we're going to get into. Okay. So jumping back to Inglorious Bastards, because I think he did do a few mainstream movies. He did one called uh, Carnage, I think, which I haven't seen. But um, in preparation for this episode, I went back and watched uh, Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. I also watched a couple of other appearances of his. I watched a bit of Django again to see what he was up to there. I watched uh, Downsizing a bit, the not very good uh, uh, satire movie. Uh, <laughs> With Matt Damon, where yeah. they get shrunk. Yeah, yeah. which he's also in uh, for a decent amount of time. And it only solidified my, my feeling about this. Oh, so without further preamble, let's, let's get into it. So... Colonel Hans Landa, right? Let's let's talk about this role for a second. This is uh, a role that, according to pop culture history, uh, Tarantino really struggled to fill, actually. Mm-hmm. And in his whole time of working with this particular script, one of his main worries about it was, I just don't know if I can ever cast Hans Landa. Yeah. Because you need someone who's an absolute... Uh, what's the word like diamond in the rough like it's like a one in a million kind of actor you need someone who's trilingual who's able to convincingly be evil but at the same time convincingly be very diplomatic and, and well spoken and and capable of y- you can believe the fact that they could switch sides or do something kind of double crossing even and charming not just comic exactly right? exactly yeah. uh, and spoilers for inglorious bastards obviously coming uh, just yeah. in case anyone. the rest of the episode so so we we find someone in Christoph Waltz who is absolutely cast in the role of the lifetime. Like this, this is you could not write a better role for Christoph Waltz specifically. And why is that? I'll, I'll give a few reasons. Number one, he's a newcomer. His face is unseen, and us as viewers don't know who he is. Right. So he comes in with zero presuppositions. We haven't seen him in anything yet. So we're ready to see who is this guy. We're like open to seeing whatever he's like. Christoph Waltz, then, second of all, if you watch any interview with him, if, if you see him on any of the late night talk shows, any long form interview on YouTube, anything like that, he is basically Hans Landa. Oh. And I'm sorry now, but he's also the same freaking character that he did in Django. He's, he, this is who he is. He's a really odd dude. <laughs> like, he's a, an extremely pleasant, like, super smiley um, off the cuff, but also kind of like bizarrely weird. Like, like he drifts off into weird topics sometimes. Like he remains charming and tries to be funny, but also just misses the mark sometimes. Sometimes his smile is off-puttingly, you know, positive. But basically, as I was watching Inglorious Bastards again for the third time, love the film, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I couldn't help but feel that this guy isn't actually really acting. And if you if you go back and watch it now, right? Look for how many times in the movie does Christoph Waltz have to do any acting at all? Just genuinely. Because if you approach the film as a very interesting, charismatic German guy reading the lines that he was told to read in a friendly way, Mm. you you could actually have him do that whole film without even knowing he was evil. And he would have done an amazing job in a lot of the scenes that he did, right? His main conveyance, like his main portrayal all the way through is that he's a he's doing something very polite and he's being a bit kind of evil about it, you know? But he's not like outwardly evil. He's not like, grr, I'm, I'm so annoyed, right? The range of emotions he has to convey is actually extremely limited. Other than two scenes where he strangles uh, the, the actress lady at yes, the end. Yes, Van and Hammersmark. Then, Van Hammersmark. And then when he uh, is obviously being branded by Brad Pitt at the end with the, with the swastika, right? right. These, are, these are the only moments where he's like, in any way having to act like uh, that he's angry or upset or negative because every other scene is ha 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 I'm Christoph Waltz ha 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 like you know it it, it is actually extremely one dimensional right mm. so all I'm saying is Tarantino and we can talk and we will talk I'm sure in many future episodes about yeah, the genius of Tarantino's casting in mm. particular mm. and every character with some exceptions in his entire filmography is insanely well cast and Christoph Waltz is absolutely no exception however I defy anybody to point to any Christoph Waltz role where he's not, where he is A, doing a good job and B, not playing himself. Because I swear, if you go watch Django, it's the exact same yeah. character again. It's, it's literally Hans Landa, except a good guy instead of a bad guy. Mm. But he's still the quirky, odd, what's he up to? Really smiley, polite, well-spoken, charismatic, charming, but still 
a little bit uh, weird Christoph Waltz, okay? Mm. So this is my starting point, and I'll, I have a couple more things to, to build on here. So amazingly well-written character who he happens to fit extremely well. There's one other aspect that we need to briefly drop in on here, and it was a, a topic we've met, talked about a bit during the week, right? The trope of the bad guy in movies having a foreign accent. Now, this is not directly Christoph criticism anymore, so let's let's park my Christoph criticism train okay. and just 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 postulate a bit with me on this one, right? Yeah. We have been trained since childhood, literally, since since our exposure to media, we have been trained, especially in the Western English speaking world, mm -hmm. to suspect and mistrust characters who don't speak with a native English accent. And that's not me saying it. There is a quite interesting paper that was published in 1998, admittedly, but still uh, an academic paper which captured this exact phenomenon in depth and uh, found quite, quite convincingly, actually, that there is uh, literally data to support the idea that if a character doesn't speak native English or if they speak with a German, Russian, Eastern European accent, they have a higher probability in children's TV shows to be evil. evil Sometimes characters. even a British accent for the American audience. In fact, yeah. I have that quote here. So in the study, they mentioned uh, the foreign accent most often employed by villains was British English. Now, these are American cartoons that they were studying. These are kids TV shows. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the quote that jumps out to me was, in terms of dialect, perhaps our most significant finding is the continued association of dialect with hero or villain status and then they, they go on to talk about the, the Cold War slash World War II effect. They say, it is perhaps surprising to note that in the late 1990s, villains continue to reflect old Cold War or World War II alliances. Mm -hmm. Many of the villains in our sample used linguistic features that were recognizably Russian, Eastern European or German. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go way off piste onto the academics of this. And it's not a perfect study. There's definitely holes in it. But the key point I wanted to make is all of us who were raised on either cartoons, TV shows, what have you, um, those are just as susceptible to biases and stereotypes as anything else. And we all now in 2022 or 2023 are just predisposed to mistrust someone even more when they have a foreign accent, yeah. when, they, when they speak with a non-native accent. So all of this to say, basically, that as an audience member, not only is he A, a new face, so someone we don't really know, B, a ridiculously well-suited casting to the role and just a perfect fit to be Hans Landa, but three, we are already primed to hate this guy because we've been culturally indoctrinated to hate people with foreign accents, at least mm -hmm. subconsciously. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those three factors combined, I think, explain a bit why he was such a breakout hit and why he got ended up getting an Oscar. And I think if you never heard of this guy before, Christoph Waltz, watched Inglorious Bastards and press pause at the end and then ask someone a survey question, which is, is he a good actor? Their answer will be, he's an unbelievably good actor. Right. Because you, if the, if this was a guy who can do that role and he can do, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis level versatility across the board, right. I would be like, amazing job, mate. You're, you're an, literally a world beating act, actor. You're like best mm -hmm. in class. But the point I'm going to make is, and as I'm kind of repeating now, he hasn't and won't, I don't think, do anything in, in, let's say, in Hollywood. I'm sure in his native language or his second language, which is, I believe, French, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Or he speaks Italian as well. So he yeah. speaks German, French, Italian. I'm sure Four that in, in those native languages of his, he probably can put in a more convincing job as a character with, with a different you know, personality or background. But in English, he has his one way of speaking and... It is super compelling in certain characters, but uh, my point here, to wrap, to wrap up this postulation, which is now gone a little bit longer, but uh, it's okay. My point is that a, gr a good actor is well suited to the, to the role that they've been put in and they do a good job conveying it. But a great actor has a much broader ability to play all sorts of different roles. And in this example, everything I've seen Christoph Waltz in I just saw him in Pinocchio. He plays the villain in the new um, Pinocchio movie on Netflix. Oh, it came recommended to me. Guillermo del Toro movie, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, it's yeah. worth watching. Uh, the voice of Pinocchio is probably the most annoying sound you'll ever hear in your life. Now I'm definitely going to watch yeah. it. Thanks just for that. that. Just for that. <laughs> but uh, Christoph Waltz puts in a, an awfully average performance as the baddie. Okay. And the reason why is I didn't know he was in it. And within 10 seconds of the baddie approaching, I was like, oh, it's Hans Landa again. Here we go. Because it's he just does this one, hello, it's me, Christoph Waltz. Like, it, it, you literally... <laughs> that was almost Christopher Walken there. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Well, the thing... Uh, <laughs> no. uh, so... 
Wow. Okay. There's, can I can I cap this off with a final quote, right? Because I think this is okay. this is the feather in the cap of this postulation. You're giving me a lot to work with here, so for sure. Yeah, but let, let me drop this bomb on you, and then I'll hand <laughs> over, right? Because you haven't dropped bombs yet. Somebody agrees with me on this, and I'm going to read a quote from an actor, and then let's see if you think that okay. this actor has it right. This actor said, "There's no such thing as a good actor or a bad actor. There's just right or wrong." Some actors may be more flexible, so they'll be right for more roles than others, but you shouldn't be cast if you're not right. In this way, typecasting is essential. So that's a, that's a quote from an Oscar-winning actor, actually. Do you know which actor said that? Ooh. Give me the era, at least. I'll jump straight to the punchline. Oh, don't tell me who it is. It's Christoph Waltz. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. The cat that I'm got the cream little... over here. Oh. So... Don't take my word for it. Take Christoph Waltz's word for it. He believes, just like I do, mm. that there's good acting and there's bad acting, but yeah. the great actors are versatile. Well, I doubt he would, you know, publicly call himself a great actor. Well, so. some do. I mean, well, uh, yeah, that's true. for every Christoph Waltz, there's a hundred, uh, I'm amazing, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, there's some... Uh, anyway, okay. what's, your, what's your reaction to that now? So, to start with, with Christoph, right? I yeah. think... I, I see your point, right? He's playing a version of himself in all of these. And mm -hmm. when he's tried to stray away from that, for example, that wonderful uh, downsizing with Matt Damon, it it's hasn't awesome. really panned out, right? So yeah. I think your point, uh, where it resonates with me, is more less about this good actor, great actor, as much as versatility of the actor. And to me, those are related points. So, so for yeah. you, a great actor has to be highly versatile is what you're but saying. But right? think of the definition of the word, right? It's mm. like, how good are you at acting not as yourself, right? Because I could cast you in the Nicola Volpe biopic story and you would smash it. You'd be, and everyone would be like, whoa, I believed him as the character because that is you, right? A lost in so that's, Exactly. So that's not acting, right? And I think Tarantino is a genius at this too, where mm. he picks a character where you believe them because it's just them that he's casting, right? So I think still acting is the act of being someone else. Yeah. But you look at it over a career arc, right? Yeah. yeah. Because what you the argument you could make, and I guess, you know, I'm, I'm going to, for all our Austrian listeners that haven't tuned out and filed mm. a complaint yet or sure. reported Neil for abuse, <laughs> I'm going to start to mount a bit of a defense here. Please. You can be a great actor, not just a great acting performance, but you can be a great actor on the day for that movie mm -hmm. and for the one after, right? So sure. let's say Inglorious sure. Bastards, uh, Django. So yep. when we talk about Inglorious Bastards, huh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of wind through this without uh, a set agenda on where sure, I'm going sure, with sure. it. Um, but I feel, Christoph, I owe it to you, man. Inglorious Bastards, I think we would both agree one of the better films of the yep. century of this 21st uh -huh, century, uh -huh. right? Uh, rebirth of Quentin Tarantino. He was mm -hmm. a bit down eh, in the years before mm -hmm. that in 2009. He did kind of that grindhouse yeah. after Kill Bill, and it wasn't really... Mm -mm. And this was meant to be, and in fact, spoiler alert, that's how the movie ends with yeah. This Is My Masterpiece, exactly, right? Exactly. With This was supposed to be that. He had had it in the drawer for 10 years, and a lot of that rested on the fact that he couldn't find somebody to fill the role of Colonel mm -hmm. uh, Hans Lander of the SS, like you said. Um, now, listen to who he offered that role to. Who oh. was he in talks for that role with? Hmm. Number one, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, disaster. What inglorious bastards do we get with that? Now, keep in mind, he mm -hmm. does speak a bit of German, which he learned from his grandmother, and probably mm -hmm. with his dedication he could have. Mm -hmm. But... You might just have a movie where they actually speak English throughout, right? And mm. you don't have the beauty of having yeah, the part of it, right? Language, All yeah. the original languages. So yeah. that was one. They couldn't, he couldn't see it ultimately, mm -hmm. Tarantino. And I think Leo couldn't either. And they had a very honest and open discussion, mm -hmm. uh, as legends do. Another one, native German speaker, German-Irish, who you actually uh, see in Inglourious yeah, Bastards, Michael. your man, yeah. Michael Fassbender. He tried to get the role on five different occasions. Was it devastated that he could? Quentin just couldn't see, right? Mm. So, and then, you know, whatever happens, you know, divine intervention, ex machina, whatever, Christoph Waltz, and the role is tailored for him. Mm. A absolutely. Um, I, I totally agree on that hand, but he still has to show up and mm -hmm. he still has to do the job, yeah. and he still has to fine-tune, right? Um, there's anecdo anecdotes on this where Quentin actually had to hold him back on various occasions, not mm -hmm. physically, but tell him, hey, Christoph, 
go 60% mm-hmm. because if not, you're going to dominate the entire yeah. film, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An actor that is able to work with those nuances mm-hmm. for me mm-hmm. of going up and down, you know, knowing mm-hmm. the right moment to be all out, to be flamboyant, knowing when to bring it back, mm-hmm. uh, you, you need to have some significant chops and or schooling in that, which I think mm-hmm. you, you kind of see the theater element uh, shining through of that. Now, it's not, he's not just a great actor in the film because nobody else could have done it. I think we've established that mm-hmm. part, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, could have done it that way. Um, I think what he did here was he took a type of character which had become very much a caricature over the years. Mm-hmm. In, in World War II films, the, the, the Nazi officer or Nazi commander, you know, we, we, we had pigeonholed it a certain way for so long, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He managed to, and this is a lot also of what you mentioned of how he just is even on a late night show, right? Mm-hmm. He managed to find the right balance of, I'm not going to say humanity because you don't really see that, as mm-hmm. well, but mm-hmm. unpredictability, deception, a bit of charm, and most importantly, and that's the the overarching aspect of any Tarantino film, cracking tension. Mm, mm. When he's on that screen, you're glued to it. The first 20 minutes discussing with Monsieur Lapedite over over the glass of milk. The glass of milk. I mean... The, the hairs stand up on the back of my head. I am mm-hmm. terrified by him, but I am not terrified by him in terms of, oh, chainsaw massacre. Mm-hmm. I'm terrified, actually, by the fact that he's just there at the table, paging through his book, dipping his pen in the ink, mm-hmm. going about it like a bureaucrat <laughs> Such a when you know yeah. what the intentions are, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think many actors, I genuinely don't think many can pull that off the nonchalance mm. of evil yeah. instead of going just for the caricature. We have also in the film, we have a guy, and I don't know his name, mm. uh, playing Hitler, for example. Yeah. Well, yeah, but in the classic al- caricature, caricature, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, totally, totally. Um, so I think the fact that he's able to do that, mm. uh, like that, uh, that shows significant acting chops. Great actor in that sense. Now, mm-hmm. and, and I watched Inglorious Bastards in preparation for this, and like you did as well, mm-hmm. a bit of Django. Yes. Then... Not looking at Inglorious Bastards in isolation, mm-hmm. you move to Django and you know it's Christoph Waltz. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not, there's no body transformation or any of yeah, this. Yeah. There's no, the voice is that. But does he also make that movie? To a large extent, I think he does. So I, I think we establish, we agree, you can't have Inglorious Bastards without Christoph. Yep. Right? Mm hmm. And I think what I'm trying to get you to come that he also does the small things which make the mm. performance work and make it timeless. For sure. In much the same way, though, that if he was here with us, we would also be having a phenomenal time because he, he is just like a, an amazing character of a person, you know. Right. All I'm saying is like... We should invite him on, actually. I would love to have him on. And he could defend himself. If it, oh, he, he'd probably agree with me. Actually, judging by what he said in interviews, he would probably be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm terrible, Neil. You're dead right. He joined the podcast just for that. Exactly. He'd fly out. He's a very humble guy. Like, I love... As a guy, he's, he's amazing. Mm. And like, I have nothing but... I'm nothing but delighted that he has found huge success. And I'm not surprised because he was phenomenally well cast, both in Inglorious and also Django. Like, I don't think the Django character needs to be Christoph Waltz. Like, I could see a huge range of people doing a great job of it. But uh, in, in Inglorious Bastards, it literally had to be Christoph Waltz for it to, to be as good as it was. Yeah. So I, I do get what, what you're saying as well about, like, you know, only a certain level, an actor of a certain level could hold down that level of tension that he did or establish, you know, or, or make that scene what it is. But from a writing point of view, Quentin himself says that that scene is one of the best things he's ever done. Mm-hmm. Also, and, and it, beyond writing, just in terms of how well that scene is made, how it's shot, the cinematography, the intertextuality of it, how it references other movies, like it has so much it's going genius. on. genius. Start to finish. And that's a scene that you can just watch over and over. Like mm-hmm. you can go to YouTube every few weeks and watch that scene. It's just ridiculous. Um, if I can try and convince you with one more quote from the man himself, because I, I was, I, I really d- dug deep into like, what has he said about this, about his own Crystal. Yeah, because okay. I suspect that he, he maybe knows that like, he was well cast rather than, let's say, right. uh, an amazing actor. And right? humble enough to oh, admit yeah. it. Right? One of the few, one of the few who probably right. would say it, right? And he did say um, a slightly different quote to the same topic, which was, on account of the years I've spent working, I've just come to realize more thoroughly and more often what's involved making films work. Mm. He, he pauses, and it's certainly not my talent. Now, I'm not saying he's saying I'm a shit actor. He, he knows he's like a decent actor, right? But I think he rightly is recognizing that for, an, for us to sit and say a film is absolutely amazing, we're saying it not because 
actor A turned in a great job and therefore it's a great movie because it requires incredible direction, incredible writing, incredible cinematography, mm. sound, editing. A lot of pieces these, need to come so together. So important, yeah. yeah. And after all of that, there's just this magic intangible it factor that has to come for you to love a movie as well you know like some great movies are more than the sum of their parts in a sense and i think that's also a big part of when we walk out of parasite for example we just feel like this was absolutely amazing and does parasite have any oscar winning uh, acting in it no we can't pinpoint the exactly. one thing which made that film amazing exactly but we both loved it but I we love it and it boon uh, jong ho probably is the man to to thank for that right rather than any particular actor yeah anyway i think uh, i can see we're not going to agree on this on mm. this particular topic all i'm all i'm hoping to open the door to is an awareness among say our listeners among us that when we look at the best actor winners right and there have been so many over the years yeah how many of them actually were the best actor that year, right. did, did the best pretending, to put it in kids' mm, language, right? Yeah. Versus was in the right role at the right time, at the right stage of their career, with the right level of interest in them, with the right level of mm. fandom, like all these things. Because we know the Oscars are, uh, come on, a little bit, yeah. you know, uh, they're, they're, not, I mean, they're not entirely empirical, let's the say. The Academy is quite easy to catfish. Yeah, let's, let's put it As the youth way. of today would say. Indeed. So, to use terminology the, the parlance of, of, of the youth. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so but, that's, I think that was my main point, that I'm a bit frustrated when people say, oh man, Christoph Waltz, goat, goat level actor. Because, right. sorry, he's just not. Like he's, I think great provocation in terms of yeah. how do we define acting. I think exactly. the, the problem lies in that you're you know smarter than 95% <laughs> of that academy, right? <laughs> of the ones oh, choosing this. That's a big, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know a if it's a compliment. compliment. Yeah, um, but I, I, I definitely, I, I see where you're coming from with that. Um, mm. And I also see like when we see Christoph and, and stuff trying to be a leading man in a totally different context, it doesn't it doesn't land as well is it also maybe a thing of 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 practice right in terms of had he been given had the hans lander role happen maybe when he's 30 does he then mm. develop that versatility simply by being around so often instead Quite of possibly. starting basically in his 50s to Quite go in possibly. Quite so possibly. that's that's another way uh, p- potentially to look at it you know what i would love to be proven wrong so suffice to say if any time in the next few years he ends up doing a role where he's a leading man in a different personality to his own and he, he smashes it, I will eat my words, I will eat my hat, metaphorically speaking, mm. and I will take it all back, basically. But all I'm saying is I've looked, I've tried to find an example of when he has actually had to do any acting. and Or, I mean, okay, not, not to be that harsh, but like when has he actually had to stretch himself beyond his own personality? And I think I'm, I'm still looking. That's fair. I'll throw you my counter postulation cool. on, on Christoph, right. which is not that great actor, but let's say the postulation is one of the greatest villains we've seen on screen. I, and yeah. now I'm talking Colonel Hans Landa, right? Yeah, one yeah. of the greatest villains we've seen on screen in the last 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I think he is in a, there, there's been this kind of era in mm. Hollywood, which you also uh, alluded to, mm. of non-native English-speaking mm. bad guys. Yes, here we go. Uh, where we've seen some of the best ones come about recently. Indeed, we have. Um, you and I, we, we were discussing, we, we talked about three main ones. Listeners, you can come for us on Twitter. I'm sure there's a lot more to add to the list, and we're thinking of eventually just doing a, a villains yeah. uh, episode, right? Mm, mm. Three that I remember, and two especially... Um, Colonel Hans Landa and mm-hmm. Glorious Bastards. Amazing. Anton Chirurk, Shigur, Shigur yeah. Javier Bardem yeah. in No Country for Old Men, and um, Le Chouf, uh, Mads yeah. Mikkelsen's Amazing. Bond villain Amazing. in Casino Royale. Mm. Um, Mads Mikkelsen being from Denmark, Javier Bardem being uh, being Spanish, and Christoph Waltz being Austrian, mm-hmm. playing three of the best villains. Coincidentally, uh, they also all became Bond villains yeah. to dif- differing levels of success, in my opinion. And doesn't that say something about the Bond franchise a bit, that mm. it, they're a little bit risk-averse, I think, that rather than like casting someone... In a uh, in a bold move, they're like, "Who's been a great villain recently?" Okay, right. we'll take him. You know, right. which is a bit disappointing for Bond. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. It also though shows that the magnetism that that franchise has mm. that the top guys will want to play it. I mean, mm. Rami Malek in the latest one, he he had his pick, you know, yeah. of whatever films he could do, and he exactly. chose to be a Bond villain wearing a mask for half the movie. So, yeah. Yeah. there's still something, and we've discussed this franchise a lot, and also our frustrations mm. with it, right, with mm. Bond. But there's still something there that 
you yeah. know, attracts the, the best of the best. But, 100%. you know, back to my point, those three, I say, let's, let's rank those three. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to a bit of a redemption exercise for you with the, the whole Austrian <laughs> I'll populace. Need I'll need it. So the BMW triumvirate, as I've uh, begun referring to them as. BMW. The, the Bardem, Mickelson, Valtz uh, trio. Uh, I think each of these lads are as you say, top tier villains and nothing will take that away from them. The roles that they did, uh, the the characters they inhabited and and portrayed were fantastic and they did a great job in all three cases and that doesn't overrule what I said earlier about uh, about, uh, Christoph, right? For me, (laughs) as as I've often uh, said, my favorite movie of all time is still No Country for Old Men, I have to say. That's your favorite movie of all time? Yeah. I remember you mentioned of all time? Yeah, and it's been about two years since I watched it, right? Mm. And every time, I've watched it like intermittently every few years, and every time I go back, I'm like, maybe it's not as good as I remember. And then I start watching, and it's like, okay, no, it's freaking brilliant. But I wouldn't, you see, I, I can't make you an argument that it's, that, that it shouldn't be up there with one of the best. I, oh, mean, just... I, I then have a little sidebar on the, on oh, the film as oh, well. Oh, please. <laughs> but but to, to close then the ranking for me, it goes Anton Chigurh, number one, because I just think... Best realized character brought to screen in, in recent times. Just Our amazing. guy, Javier. Incredible. Mads Mikkelsen, I loved as the, as the chief, actually. Okay. Like, I, I thought, uh, I had never seen him, actually, when I saw Casino Royale. He was, that was my first Mikkelsen exposure. It's like 06. And I was like, this guy is amazing. Yeah. Mads, I, I rate one of his best performances in uh, another round, by the way. Like, Druk, I think, is, is an amazing Fantastic. job yeah. that he did there. So he, it's not just villain work. Like, he's, he's a, talk about a versatile actor. Like, he can... Like it has to be him. Like the role has to suit him, but he can also bring a lot to it. Like he can adapt the intenseness so, in the face, in the, exactly, and the the inscrutableness of the face. Like the fact that yeah. sometimes he plays it purely, you know, blank, and you have to figure out what he's thinking. Yeah. But in any case, so it goes in that order: Javier Bardem, Mads Mikkelsen, Christoph Waltz for me. Okay, that's great. Javier Bardem, head and heels. Uh, for me, potentially the best villain of all time. Yeah, of all time. That's you. Despite. Talking not so much. Uh, mm. I mean, uh, brilliantly cast. Uh, at the time, Javier Badem, also an example of not very well known to uh, mm. to uh, English speaking audiences, totally. shows up and 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 he just kills it. I, I remember when the when the film came out, I was about you know I think thirteen fourteen, yeah. and it's that age where you start to you know gravitate towards. Yeah. Films that actually make you think a bit. And also you hear about, you know, in school, oh, that movie, yeah, so scary. And he did this and he did that. And so, you know, I rented the DVD. We put it in. It was a Friday night by myself uh, down on the couch at my parents' house. And I, Spell, I, spellbound. And I, st- and I rewatched the movie every two years, though. Mm, mm. And I'm just as terrified as I was there. Yeah. It w- and it's also that age, 13, 14, where, you know, you're a teenager. It's a weird age. Mm-hmm. I woke up with a nightmare. 13, yeah. 14. I ran into my parents' bedroom. <laughs> I couldn't get yeah. Anton Shigur, Javier Badem, out of my head. Yeah. Sweating buckets, terrified. Rewatched it again a couple of years ago. Now I've seen it a bunch of times. I've mm-hmm. read the book. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what happens. Within the first five minutes, I'm sweating. Yeah. I'm terrified. And that's, for me, just the physical reaction he mm. brings out in me. Fantastic. I mean. uh, another note on Javier Badem, mm. uh, actually, and that's the point on versatility. Now it's, mm. it's getting clear in my head. Mm. Uh, he has that. Yeah. So he's done so many different roles. Uh, also, oh. of course, post No Country for Old Men, yeah. even like little uh, funny things like Vicky Cristina Barcelona, whatever. Exactly, exactly. But if you go back, and actually this is a recommendation for the listeners, his early work in, in Spanish, mm. uh, I think around 2000, 2002, a film called El Mar Adentro, The mm. Sea Within, or okay. The Sea Inside, I think is the translation, mm. where he plays this quadriplegic, Mm-hmm. which essentially doesn't get out of bed the whole film. And it chronicles the true story of uh, one of the the first big campaigners for euthanasia in Spain, in the oh, north right. of Spain, in Galicia. Okay. Beautiful film. One of those films that, for example, I've only seen it once yeah. years ago. And you know when a film, you can just recite the whole two hours in your head because yeah, it was yeah, so yeah. powerful? Well, totally different role. Yeah, than, uh, exactly. uh, than, than what he plays there. So uh-huh. I think also just in terms of actor, he's mm. one of my, my all-time favorites. Yeah. Not getting into the discussion of acting, one of my all-time mm. favorites. So Bardem, cool. number one. I'm with you. My number two is Colonel Hans Landa. 
I need to revisit um, Casino Royale again with Mikkelsen, but it's still very much a Bond villain and, and having those shades of a Bond villain. I love mm. Mads Mikkelsen, but for me, uh, that character is in his defining role, mm. whereas for the other two, I will always remember them as those characters first and foremost, regardless of mm. uh, downsizing or, yeah. uh, or whatever yeah. else they do. So, Unforgivable. Yeah, yeah, so for yeah. me, it's BWM. Yeah. Yeah. No BMW for you, sir. No, no exactly. So, uh, no, wonderful. Uh, wow, we covered a lot of ground here, but uh, I'm sure some very controversial ground. So, yeah. uh, listeners, now you have a chance. We do have a Twitter, so you can absolutely go and destroy us online. That's at InPostulation. Give us your take. Give us your postulation. We want to hear from you. Absolutely. So, uh, we'll break now, and then we'll come back with uh, an exercise for you, Neil. I have a little surprise lined up. Exciting. Welcome back, everybody, to Lost in Postulation. Uh, Neil, um, after the fiasco where you annihilated about 9 million Austrians there, Sorry, um, I have a little surprise for you. <laughs> I feel like I deserve this. Yeah, yeah go on. well, I have an Austrian pop quiz extravaganza about yeah. Austrian pop culture. This is painful. Yeah, uh, I wasn't looking forward to this, I can tell you. Yeah. yeah. So you, you didn't prepare for it, right? I did the opposite of preparing. So I, I thought about, uh, genuinely, I was about to Google the phrase Austria uh, pop quiz, fun fact. You know, I was, I was, <laughs> gonna, I was actually going to do the prep and I was like, well, I don't want to look like an idiot on a podcast. Certainly not one that I'm publishing myself. Like, why would I do that, right? But then I realized that would be no fun at all to, for the listener to hear someone just smash a bunch of pop quiz questions about Austria. So uh, I'm gonna, I did the opposite. I did zero preparation for this. Great. I knew this was coming and I, I didn't it. study. So... You know what? Apologies in advance. You, you're probably going to be shocked, listener, by how little I know, and that's okay. So, uh, listener, you might as well try to compete against Neil and then send us in your scores. Yeah. Uh, grand total of 12 points oh, up geez. for grabs oh, in this. No. Uh, I don't so even know 12 things about Austria. Like, first off, so this nine is... Nine questions, 12 oh, points. Okay, okay, so okay. there's some you cool, know, cool, cool, things cool, cool. built into that. This is going to be painful. Uh, okay. Yeah, listeners, take out your pens and papers oh, and uh, just get your quiz game on. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start with part one of the quiz, which is four questions. Mm -hmm. uh, some multiple choice, others not. Mm -hmm. uh, are you ready, Neil? I think so. I, well, as ready as I will ever realistically be, yes. Okay, question number one. Can you please name me three Austrian musicians? Oh, okay, uh, no, but uh, in, in, in short, <laughs> Wolfgang, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is, is, is one, right? Correct. I'm going to... So it can be any musician, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm, absolutely. I, I any Austrian musician. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Jesus. Um, and I, I, I'm just going to show my ignorance here. Beethoven's not Austrian, is he? No, uh, uh, it's, it's borderline because he's German, but he did really come about in, in Vienna for a long time. But I cannot give you a point for that. I'm sorry. No, then no, I no. would also annihilate the 85 million Germans who that's listen fair. to our podcast. No, that's fair. Wagner? Is he German? He's German? Yeah. Um, give up. You give up? Yeah. Are, you, are you sure? Oh, like, all time, the thing is, it doesn't only really have to be the classic. The thing player. is, when you give me them, I'm going to be like, oh, of course. But just here sitting here, I'm like okay. drawing a complete blank. Yeah. So, Neil, other ones you could have chosen, but mm. not limited to Schubert. Okay. I don't feel bad for getting for missing that okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Strauss, senior. Okay. Okay. These, Strauss, these are respectable. Junior. These would have been. Okay. Okay. That was. Yeah. I could have got two freebies. <laughs> okay, two exactly. freebies there. Yeah. And more recent times, mm. Conchita Wurst. Yep. Eurovision respect. winner 2014, I believe. Big respect to Conchita, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I actually don't feel too bad about this. You, no, got, you got one point, I right? I got the household so, name, and yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't miss Mozart. So, you know, this is, this is good. Exactly. Yeah. And that leads us uh, wonderfully into our second question, because right. you mentioned Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I sure did. Uh, can you tell me which city he is originally from? Multiple choice. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Helping you out a bit here. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, most of our listeners might not need the multiple choice, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. To respect the listener. Yeah. A. Innsbruck. Mm -hmm. B. Vienna. Mm -hmm. C. Salzburg. Mm -hmm. D. Linz. I actually had a reaction to Innsbruck there. Now, okay. is that because I just have heard of it before or because Mozart is from there? 
I'm going to go with Innsbruck. You're going to go with Innsbruck. Final mm. answer, A, Innsbruck. Yeah, lock it Wolfgang in. Amadeus Mozart is from Salzburg. No. Yeah. The hills are alive with the sound of Wolfgang. Yes. Oh, we're, are, is that a question later? Okay. No, um, yeah. So now, speaking of Salzburg, yes, yes, can yes. you tell me which company has its headquarters just outside of Salzburg in Füchsel am See? That's not Nestle, is it? Final answer? Nestle? I mean, is that your final uh, answer? I, I think I've, dri I've driven past it, actually. Potentially. Remember, we're talking about Austria. Oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, I jumped straight to the quickest answer there. So which company has its headquarters in Salzburg? So it Austrian would have to be company. an Austrian company. Right? That, is, that is a lo logically cognizant uh, or cogent uh, <laughs> argument. Yes, I, I'm with you. Any, any hints on the industry or just general uh, uh, it's, it's cars? It, it's a product you've most certainly consumed. Okay. Um, okay. It's uh, so so. It's something you can cons you can ingest. Oh no! Like I'm, I I feel it's confectionery related somehow, but I just I, I don't want to take a punt on a Swiss company like like, like Nestle. No, but Austrian. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's what I'm it. saying. Don't I know, I'm way it. off base here. Um, and it's not like no Lint is Swiss as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, You're gonna hit yourself. I am Austrian food company. It's not like. A, Dr. Oetker or something like that. No, no, it's no. not Dr. Oetker. No, to I, my knowledge, it's not. I don't Dr. think that's Oetker. even a, even a German. It's actually or? something you know a lot better than Dr. Oetker. Oh, it's not one of our. It's not like, like it's yeah. brand wise, like chemist. Okay, is it? I'm gonna have to push you. For okay, time. I, I, I give up. I give up. You I, sure? Yes. No guess. I don't want to risk the humiliation of a, of a, of a okay. guess. Okay. Yeah. The answer uh, of the company that has its headquarters in Fuchselamse is Red Bull, Ooh, Neil. Oh, yes. The I energy have, drink I manufacturer. I should have got that. That is, I'm a, as, as a bit of a new Formula One fan these days, I should have picked up on that. Yeah, that's my bad. Uh, do you like Red Bull? The drink or the company? Like, the, I mean, <laughs> the drink. Because the drink, no, not necessarily no, very much. But what they're about and kind of the way that they, they mm. go about, I'm like... That's cool. I would Extreme like to see more Red Bulls out there, you know? Fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, um, unfortunately, though, you have one point out of five so far. Okay, but uh, one is a lot more than zero. So. I, absolutely. You can yeah. really be proud. Uh, you, you can still, you know, mm. get get close to 50%. I can get a C. Here. I can get a C minus here. Generous C minus, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, question number four. Hit me. Austria has hosted the modern day Olympics twice mm -hmm. in 1964 and 1976. Can you tell me where? Oh, they're both in the same place? Or like in the same, they're uh, two different both places. Both in Austria. Yeah, but two different places, right? Or not? I'm shrugging. Great podcast content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nicola, Nicola shrugs. Um, hmm. Okay, so it, I guess you can't just say uh, Vienna twice, right? Because that's it's just not going to be that. And we've had Salzburg, and it's probably not going to be Salzburg again. So I'm going to say Innsbruck twice. Is that your final answer? No, actually, can I go one Vienna, one, in, one, Vienna, one Innsbruck? Okay, so you're going for a diversification strategy. Yeah, I'm just scattering my, my shotgun shell here. Is yeah. that your final answer? Yes. Um, which one? Uh, okay. Oh, well, oh, am I on the on on so, on tracker? Yeah. In 1964... Innsbruck. The Winter Olympics were hosted by Innsbruck. Yes, smashed it. In 1976, the Winter Olympics were hosted by Nothing. Innsbruck again. Oh, you so had it. I had and it. You had it. to the final yeah. answer. This was a calculated decision. I wasn't willing to double down on Innsbruck. So. Very strategic, yeah, tactical. Exactly. Fact. Exactly. Yeah. So after round one, Neil, we've accumulated one out of no, uh, two. sorry, two out of seven points. Let's good. give credit where it's due. Sweet. Now we have uh, what I'm calling a rapid fire round. Cool. Where I am going to read out to you five categories, mm -hmm. one at a time, and you need to give me an Austrian related oh, to that category. I'm so bad. Okay, yeah. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Number one, Formula One driver. Uh, La uh, Lauda, Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda is yes, correct. Well God. done, Neil. So that is one more point there. Jeez. Your grand total goes up to three. Fun fact on this one, after having discussed Inglorious Bastards, mm. is that uh, in the biopic, Ron Howard's biopic, Rush, where mm. he tells mm. about James Hunt and Nicky Amazing. Lauda's uh, Amazing. rivalry, yeah. Nicky Lauda is played by Daniel Bruhl. From Inglorious Bastards. Who plays yeah. Frederick Zoller. Talk about a good actor. Jeez, exactly. that's a guy who can... Uh, 
Various performances. There you go. Yeah. We've only seen him twice, though, haven't we? No, no. No, he, he's, he's, he's some in some franchise, didn't he? He's in uh, the Marvel movies. He was there in, you go. Uh, yeah, that yeah. explains why. He's amazing. So, yes, we've only seen him twice if he's been in Marvel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, Neil, well done. Now, dessert. Uh-oh. Wait, what? Dessert. That's the category. You need to tell me a an person. ultra in dessert. Oh. Yeah, not uh, a person. Oh, sorry. I see. Okay, I thought it was okay. going to be people. No, no, no. Okay, no, okay, no, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Um, strudel. Yes, yeah. Neil. Apfelstrudel. Yes. Apfelstrudel. That is another point. I would have also taken Kaiserschmann or Sachertorte. Wouldn't have gotten those. So, Not a fan. Uh, no, okay. I've never heard of them. So okay, fantastic. Swing so, and a miss on those. But, but uh, uh, two more points hey, from this uh, category. It. Turning it around here. Yeah. Next category okay. psychoanalysis. Hey, Sigmund. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund, hey, your man. That's another point. Look at you. Boom. On a roll. I was just pretending that I don't know things <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. are Austrian. Yes. Uh, candy. Oh, no. This I should know. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not, uh, it's not very obvious. It's a bit mean, but candy. Okay, okay. That's not Haribo, is it? Should I lock it in? Yeah, Haribo? Are you locking it in? Yeah, lock it in. Ooh, that's German, Neil. Uh, uh, this is so painful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, so, uh, here I also learned something. Well, one of them would have been, can be quite obvious if you're familiar with them, mm. Mozart Kuglen. Mozart balls. Yeah. Don't Linda on them? Or? Little no. chocolate balls yeah. with Mozart's face on the wrapper. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah? Rings a bell. Rings okay. A bell. Yeah. Um, I, we actually brought some back from, from the airport the other day. I can bring you one. Please do, because so I need them for, redeem for, yourself for research purposes. Yeah. <laughs> and Pez. Ah, Do you remember Pez? Yeah, yeah, of course. With those, yeah, yeah. Uh, you would get like the Batman uh, cartridge. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that was Austrian. I no, I hadn't thought it was no, American no. or British. You would think, yeah. yeah. Jeez, those Austrians. Pez. I don't yeah. remember how they taste, but I remember Pez. They're basically just sugar capsules. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Amazing. But incredible technology. Yeah. I mean, like for kids, technology. great, great yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, seriously. Yeah. I, think they're I think they're still around, right? Yeah, yeah. So Pez is Austrian. So we're also learning things, right? Fantastic. Uh, and the final one, Neil, economics. Uh oh. Uh, ooh. People, huh? Yeah, yeah, now we're back on people, but... Uh, well, you could also give me the theories, but I think it's easier mm, if you give me the people. Yeah, it's equally difficult, I would say. Um, ooh, I'm going to have to pass, I think, on this, because yeah. I wish You're I could pass. name even a Germanic-sounding economist, but I'm right. just, like, clutching at straws here. Yeah. Okay, so your options were Friedrich Hayek, okay. Nobel Prize winner for uh, how... Changing prices communicate info. Hmm. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, Schumpeter coin creative heard. destruction. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh-huh. All the, about the economists him. love this guy. Yeah, yeah, they have yeah, a, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Cool. And um, Drucker, Peter Drucker, no. the the guru the of Pedro, management thinking. Uh, yeah. yeah, so he he's was not, he was not. born in Austria. Really? A la Arnold Schwarzenegger really? made his way to America. Huh? I had I didn't know that either. But Dude, Peter geez, Drucker. There you go. Yeah. That I wouldn't have guessed. Thinking fast and slow. No, that's not him. He's uh, that's Kahneman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, What's Drucker? What, what book Drucker is, is a bunch of those ones before now. Yeah. He's always you'll find his quotes yeah. on LinkedIn and yeah, stuff. Yeah, Management yeah, yeah. guru, so to speak. Jeez, so, okay. Neil, I'm going to total up your points here. We have three from this last section plus two before. It is a five out of twelve. Um, Huge. Respectable. I, I would think say, definitely respectable. I would say we pulled it back in the second half there, and uh, that's all I could have asked for. So fantastic, yeah. fantastic and, work. And I hope you, you learned a bit more about Austria. I learned 12 uh, things, yeah. I hope our Austrian listeners uh, see your effort, and uh, mm. we'll, we'll just get better and better. I'm sure you're going to nail me on the next quiz. Oh, 100%. Uh, Jeez, get a yes. taste of my own medicine. You're going to get absolutely destroyed on the... Uh, to be confirmed quiz that I haven't decided yet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, any parting words or parting shots for uh, for our listeners before we go? I don't think I have much to say other than please do chip in with your thoughts on this. Please I think do. Uh, this this we podcast is at its best when it's generating conversations, right? When it's like bringing people to us to say, "Hey, I totally disagree with you on this." I want, that's what we want to hear, right? So, if you're if you've been listening to this in a furious rage and just boiling over with anger at how wrong we are. That's the perfect time to tweet slash email at us. And in the next episode, I promise we will uh, we'll open the mailbag and see what we've got. Fantastic. That's a bingo. That is a bingo, Christoph. Thank you for your great acting as always. And uh, thank you, Nicola, for postulating with us once more. Thanks, Neil Fitzpatrick, for the helping me navigate the, uh, the postulations. Anytime. And until next time. <laughs>